Hi, um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Nanjala Nyabola and I wear many hats and I'm here in my capacity as a writer and researcher um, with a focus on the intersection between technology, society, politics, and media. I'm so excited to be part of this panel and to be moderating this conversation because I think what we have before us um, gathered in the viewpoints of the panelists and in the work product that they've shared with us is some of the most insightful and incisive um, reflection on one of the most urgent matters of our time. I think increasingly we're seeing technology being deployed in contexts where it causes and compounds exist pre-existing harms. And racism is one of those pre-existing harms that um, we are starting to get better at articulating, but we're not quite there yet as a global society. And I think what these reports um, have done is that they've helped us narrow down on the question of questions on these questions, on why they matter, on why more people should be paying attention to them, and on why this really should be very high up on the national, international agenda, um, thinking about our shared tech futures, our shared digital futures. Um, for, as I said, for me personally, this is a very exciting conversation because these are issues that I've been researching and thinking about. And in fact, um, I've just uh, had the privilege of publishing a book on the issue of migration and identity and what it looks like from the perspective of a person um, or, or of, a, of a community of a society that is constantly criminalized, that is constantly otherized at the border. And to see this, these conversations finally start to take center stage in the conversation about tech is tremendously inspiring because I think so many people have been fighting and talking about these issues um, for so many years. And we are all finally being heard. We're all finally being seen by people who have power to stop and to force reflection on all of us. So as I said, I personally am very excited to be part of this conversation. I think our panelists are tremendous. I think they represent some of the best um, thinking and reflection on this and, and, and perspectives that are not just grounded in technical efficiency, because I think sometimes technical efficiency, people who build technology, technology gets stuck in the idea of technically technical efficient you know as long as the tech does what the person who commissioned it's um, asked for then we think that the tech is good but really what we have here are panelists who are going to give us the human dimension of some of this technology the impact that it has on your sense of identity and self and particularly at the border which is this very contentious and very fraught space where states are trying to make themselves felt are trying to project their power and individuals are increasingly finding themselves fleeing towards the border as international conflict, international crisis, international upheaval um, spreads around the world. So I'm very excited to get into this conversation. And I think we're going to begin by sharing um, a, some, a, a video with you to sort of prompt the conversation. But before we do that, allow me to share the bios of some of our panelists so that you can have a sense of who you're going to be listening to over the next few, um, over the next hour or so. Our first panelist is Finula Ni Eileen. I'm sorry if I pronounced that uh, incorrectly. Um, she was appointed in 2017 by the United Nations Human Rights Council as UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedom while Countering Terrorism. She was re-elected by states for a further three-year term in 2020. She also serves as a faculty director of the Human Rights Center of the University of Minnesota the Rabina Chair in Law, Public Policy and Society, a University Regents Professor, and concurrently a Professor of Law at, the universe, at Queen's University of Belfast School of Law. Fanola is also the board chair of the, uh, is also on the board, sorry, of the Center of the Center for Security and a leading expert on emergency powers law. She was board chair of the Open Society Foundation Women's Rights Program from 2011 to 2017. Fanola was also representative of the prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia at domestic war crimes trials in Bosnia, at domestic war crimes trials in Bosnia between 1996 and 1997. In 2003, she was appointed by the UN Secretary General as a special expert on promoting gender equality in times of conflict and peacemaking. She was appointed by the Irish Minister of Justice to the Irish Human Rights Commission in 2000, where she served until 2005. Um, our next panelist is Jaivet Elom, who is originally from Burma, 
and serves as the Chief Strategic Officer at the Canadian Rohingya Development Initiative. Javed is currently studying at the University of Toronto with a focus of, on economics and political science. He is also community manager at Needs List, a public benefit corporation seeking to advance hum the humanitarian aid sector by leveraging AI. Javed has ex extensive experience in the social impact of INGO and INGOs and aid in finding innovative opportunities for displaced persons and refugees. Prior to residing in Canada, Jaivat was a refugee who spent over five years in Australia's offshore detention system on Manus Island, Papua New Guinea. His time on detention, his miraculous escape, and his journey to Canada has been detailed in a number of media outlets. His personal experiences of loss and survival have strengthened his commitment to helping disadvantaged people globally. And finally, last but certainly not least, uh, Tendaya Chume is a fifth special rep rapporteur on contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. She was appointed to the Human Rights Council in September 2017 and took up her functions as special rapporteur on the 1st of November 2017. Ms. Atume is currently a law professor at the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA School of Law, and a research associate for the African Center for Migration and Society at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. She's a core faculty member of the UCLA School of Law Promise Institute for Human Rights and the Critical Race Studies Program, as well as the Epstein Program of Public Interest Law and Politics. Uh, before we jump into the video, I just want to remind you that this is an interactive, as interactive as these conversations can be um, a conversation. And so we would urge you to please use the chat function in Zoom to ask your questions. We'll get to as many of them as possible during the course of the conversation. Um, and please feel free to use social media uh, presence, uh, both uh, Twitter and we're also live on YouTube. So there's a chat function on YouTube. Share your opinions, share your perspectives, invite people to join the conversation. Because as I said from the beginning, I really do sincerely think this is one of the most urgent issues of our time. And it's great that we've all managed to come together for this pivotal conversation. So I'm going to stop there for a second and allow our tech team to share a video with you that I will set up our conversation. I'm really pleased to join this conversation as Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights, and particularly to outline the approach of the mandate to some of the issues that are going to be addressed by uh, Special Rapporteur uh, Achume. In particular, I do want to stress the importance of these issues around technologies, borders, and counterterrorism to the mandate I hold. And I have recognized, as I suppose have both my predecessors, that datification of counterterrorism and the role of new technologies in counterterrorism is a pivotal and often underappreciated aspect of the consolidating security power of the state in multiple arenas. Um, this uh, focus on the use of technology in counterterrorism is really not a new aspect, but it has been consolidated by the role in particular of international entities and, and global institutions. In particular, the United Nations Security Council has played a particularly decisive role in enabling states to use technology in the counterterrorism arena. And there, I speak in particular to UN Security Council Resolution 2396 of 2017 that decides that member states, for example, have to implement and develop systems to collect biometric data, including fingerprints, photography, facial recognition, and as well as ensuring uh, uh, the collection of other kinds of data to advance common counterterrorism goals. It's important to acknowledge that this work of consolidating and utilizing technology in counterterrorism happens in spaces that are broadly closed. They are happening in fora that not even all states have access to, recalling that the Security Council is five permanent members plus 10 uh, elected members. But more than that, these are spaces that do not have access from uh, impartial and independent civil society and those on the ground who are most affected by these measures. These measures which are developed in these securitized spaces are also measures that lack any kind of independent oversight. So as states through the Security Council and increasingly through the General Assembly and the Office of Counterterrorism at the UN 
advance and consolidate and validate the use of these technologies, there's no independent oversight or accountability for the human rights consequences and negative and downstream effects of those uses. Mandates special procedures, including Special Rapporteur Achume and my own office, have really limited capacity to do the kind of consistent, deep, and day-to-day -day oversight of uh, the widespread use of these technologies in practice. And as we've seen in a number in, in the reports that uh, will be discussed, um, we see the use of these technologies to target the most vulnerable. Uh, Tendai's report focuses on the widespread focus and, and use of these technologies against refugees and migrants, the framing of these groups as national security threats. We also see, as my mandate sees every day, the use of these technologies at borders to target civil society actors, uh, to, to target those who are even advocating for the rights of others at borders. And so these spaces have become highly securitized spaces that are governed by international mechanisms that are broadly unaccountable, unseen, and under, uh, under supported from a human rights perspective. And what does this mean going forward? It means, in fact, that both mandates, um, I think, are underscoring the extent to which we need consistent and sustained human rights attention to these spaces. We need to understand the role that security is playing in these spaces and how technology and security are, in fact, sort of um, uh, working with one another in these spaces. We also have to stress the importance of the human rights absences and the need for human rights due diligence. This includes data protection, but I do want to say that data protection and privacy are uh, the necessary but not sufficient means to uh, uh, protect human rights in these spaces. Um, and finally, I think we need a, a sustained conversation about the production of these norms in the first place and the consequences for a failure to engage um, human rights in a sustained way to allow civil society in these spaces and actually to ensure that these spaces are opened up to global scrutiny and that we hold accountable those states who are advancing security agendas through the use of technologies and naming the disparate effects that they have on the communities who are the subject of those measures. Fantastic presentation that I think sets us up for a great conversation. Um, I'm joined right now uh, by Tendai Chime, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, forms of on racial discrimination um, and the author of this tremendous report that I really can't emphasize enough, especially if you're working in the technology space. I think these are really urgent questions that I, we, we have to start drilling down on and challenging ourselves and challenging our governments um, to start to think concretely about. And here is a, a blueprint to sort of help us um, get to that. And um, tonight, I'm, I'm so excited to be in conversation with you about this. Um, and, and of course, congratulations on the completion um, of the report. Um, and you know, if you're right, I. I would just love to just get straight um, into it because I feel like I have way too many questions. Uh, sure. So, can you? Um, and uh, let's begin with you know, a very simple question. Why is this an issue that, that touches on your? Nanjala, you have either you've frozen or I have frozen for everybody. I'm not sure which it is. Can you hear me? I can, I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. I think I think we're fine. I was having problems with my internet earlier. Um, thanks so much, Nanjala, for this wonderful introduction. And Jaivet, thank you also for joining the conversation. And I know we'll be talking more later. Thank you so much to all of the attendees and also to the sponsors who are hosting this event. And so what I thought I might do is talk um, a little bit about the motivations for the report and then come to your question, Nanjala, which is why is the issue of emerging digital technologies and border enforcement a racial justice 
issue because I think this is um, a really important um, place to start. And I want to start off by thanking the many researchers, um, civil society actors, uh, many of whom are refugees and migrants and stateless persons themselves, who really provided valuable input for the for the publication of the, the report. So some of them have actually joined the audience of this call, which I'm really excited about. But without the support of the Promise Institute at UCLA Law School, the UCLA Center for Critical, Critical Internet um, Inquiry and the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion and the Migration and Technology Monitor, all of these um, entities that I've described really provided very valuable spaces for input from a broad range of actors who are doing the day-to-day -day research that informs um, the report. So this, this report, which is on racial and xenophobic discrimination and emerging digital technologies in border and immigration enforcement context, it's actually the second of two reports reports that I've published on race and tech. And the first one was a general report on race and tech, and this one focuses then in on, on border and immigration enforcement specifically. And you might ask, okay, why have a report such as this? And what motivated me in, in, in my mandate is um, something that Fianola and her opening remarks refers to, which is that in the human rights uh, norm setting and advocacy context, it seems as though when we're talking about emerging digital technologies, um, the focus has tended to be on privacy, free, um, speech and expression and rights relating to those as kind of the human rights entry points into thinking about how we constrain government and private and private and private sector action in this um, space. But what is clear, and I think there's many uh, critical race uh, researchers and others who've highlighted that there is a racial justice and a racial inequality dimension to the way that these technologies are working. And it's not just um, racial um, discrimination, there's ethnic discrimination, there's gender discrimination, and it really requires attention to equality and non-discrimination human rights norms. And so the, the motivation behind both of these reports is trying to push behind a colorblind approach that ignores the racialized and ethnically disparate impact of emerging digital technology. Mm -hmm and instead directly confronts the intersectional forms of discrimination that result from and are exacerbated by the widespread adoption of these technologies. So the, the report that we're talking about today focuses specifically on digital technologies in the immigration and border enforcement context. And in the report, I use the term digital borders, which is a term that I did not invent. It was It's a term that's been used by other commentators and researchers. But in the report, I use it to refer to borders whose infrastructure and processes are increasingly relying on machine learning, automated algorithmic decision making, predictive analytics, and, and related digital technologies. And, and these technologies are, in, are integrated into the very borders themselves. They're integrated into identification documents, into facial recognition systems, ground sensors, um, area video surveillance drones, biometric databases, and even into the decision making around asylum and immigration decisions um, as well. Mm -hmm. And I should note that even though the report focuses on re relatively recent um, technological innovations, many of the technologies that are being deployed have historical antecedents and mm -hmm. colonial technologies of racialized um, governance through migration controls. And the report is fairly short, so it can't go into that history, but there are people who've written about where these technologies come from and how their origins themselves are, are rooted in, in kind of racialized uh, uh, legacies and projects, which I think is something we have to pay um, attention to. And, and, and the report highlights how governments and non-state actors, including humanitarian actors, and I know we'll talk about this more when we, when we bring Jaivet into the conversation, are using these digital technologies in ways that are uniquely experimental, dangerous, and discriminatory in the border and in immigration enforcement mm -hmm. um, context. And, and in doing so, they're subjecting refugees, migrants, um, stateless persons, and others to human rights violations, um, extracting large quantities of data from them on exploitative terms, and, and really stripping them of fundamental human rights and agency. So this is this is just some background on some motivations and kind of what the, fo the report focuses on. Mm -hmm. But I want to narrow in on your question, which is why is this a racial mm -hmm. justice um, or an equality and non-discrimination issue and not just say a privacy mm -hmm. one or other human rights? And I think, you know, we're dealing with a combination of two things. One, the presumption that technology is race neutral, which I think has been, as you mentioned, subject mm -hmm. to a lot of debunking. This idea that technology is just objective. And if anything, we can use it to step away from the inequities that characterize society to have more fair outcomes and the first report, which builds on the work of others, is really trying to debunk the sense of the race neutrality 
um, of technology. But in this report, one of the things that I'm trying to take on is the neutrality or object objectivity that is often presumed to be at the core of borders. So most people think that the borders of their nations are just, and that to the extent that they exclude people, they're excluding people on legitimate bases that don't involve things like race or ethnicity or religion or other prohibited grounds. But this is just false. We know that the global and regional and national border regimes that operate in much of the world operate on a racialized ethnic and, and kind of national origin exclusion that but mm -hmm. basically creates parallel mobilities for people depending on what they look like, what their beliefs are and where they're coming mm -hmm. from. And so when you think about who right now has to rely on the refugee regime and who has to move in precarious ways across borders, most of those people are kind of racially, ethnically um, specified and they're coming from the global south. Mm -hmm. And even in the global south, people whose movement is most precarious is usually racially, ethnically, and religiously marginalized groups as well. And so when you isolate refugees and migrants and stateless persons, people who are moving in precarious ways for specific interventions, those interventions are effectively operating on the basis of national origin, ethnic origin, race, even if that is not the prim primary intention um, of the intervention. And then if you layer over that, the idea that border regimes have become increasingly vicious, with many of them reflecting and implementing racist and xenophobic re rhetoric around refugees, migrants, and stateless persons as per se national security threats, you see this again globally. You see this in the borders of North America. You see this in European borders. You see this in, in South um, Asia. You see this, you see this um, all over the world. This, this racialization and ethnicization and kind of religious overlay of how borders operate is exacerbated then by technology, technological interventions. You know, I was, I've been surprised at some of the statistics. So UNHCR says that, you know, more than 75% of the world's stateless population belong to um, minority groups. Um, you see reports that have come out from open society, which are highlighting citizenship stripping in different parts of the world, and how even in the national security context, those who are most targeted are racial, ethnic, and religious minority groups. And so what you see is is that because operator, borders are operating in these non-neutral ways, digital borders mm -hmm. are essentially reinforcing and exacerbating structural forms of exclusion and discrimination mm -hmm. on the basis of national origin, on the basis of race, on the basis of ethnicity, in a way that means every time we're thinking about privacy concerns, every time we're thinking about right to life concerns, whatever concerns we might have in the border context, we should have at the back of our minds that there are equality and non-discrimination norms implicated mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I there's so many directions I wanted to take that because I think you've touched on um, some very important conceptual um, issues that I think people, like you said, people often think these things are neutral and they think, you know, borders are settled and this is what our country looks like and has always looked like. And, you know, for a lot of the world, that's just simply not true. There are more unsettled borders, I think, than there are those that are settled. Um, and, and there's something that you that touch the report sort of touches on, which is um, the the practice is laced with technology is contemporary but the ideology and the philosophy and the thinking behind it is not you know you, there's examples about nazi germany there's example about ibm sort of helping nazi germany build the sort of the jewish identification system that was a prelude to the holocaust um and you're seeing echoes and resonances of that in contemporary practice um what do you think um has made this an urgent issue? What developments are you seeing? You know, if you could uplift some of the examples um, in the report that have made this an urgent issue that this resurgence of this past practice laced mm -hmm. with, you know, this contemporary um, digital approach. What are some of the things that you're seeing that make this urgent? Yeah, I think I think there's a number of, of things. And, and I thank Sanjala for highlighting again that what we're dealing with is regimes that have historical antecedents and also kind of digital uh, bordered regimes that are basically implementing national projects or kind of national ideologies around the way that borders work so that it's not as though the tech is operating in one universe and then societies in mm -hmm. another universe rather it's that the tech is 
is facilitating, reinforcing being deployed in the context of much larger projects. And in terms of some of the factors that the report identifies as catalysts or as, as kind of really driving what we're seeing, again, building on the work of other researchers, is one of them is just the economic profits and, and the way that the private sector is implicated um, in this field. So the, the report talks about what some have described as the border industrial complex and how the militarization of borders and the digitization of borders is being kind of accelerated by the fact that many of the corporations that are involved stand to make large amounts of money from partnering with governments to deliver all kinds of, of solutions. And, and it's not just in the context of implementation of kind of um, you know, national security visions of borders that seem racialized on the part of governments. There's a lot of um, discourse or kind of justification that is rooted in efficiency and bureaucracy. We'll talk more about this, but you see UN agencies, for example, like UNHCR, IOM, the World Food Program, adopting digitization in the context of their border and immigration kind of work their interfaces with refugees and migrants, where a lot of the justifications are around increasing efficiency or minimizing fraud, goals that on their face seem really valuable. And so then they enter into these private sector partnerships that are driven by a kind of techno solutionism, where for every problem, there is a corporation that tells you that can it can be solved. We're seeing this in the COVID pandemic um, context, which I think is also accelerating the, the rolling out of these technologies, this, this kind of intersection of money to be made, justification, some of them neutral sounding on their face, and then also justifications that are not neutral sounding at all. Um, and and um, that interface, I think, is a very dangerous one. One of the examples that I talk about in my um, report is here in the United States, there's been a lot of pushback, for example, against um, the Trump administration's proposal to build a physical border wall. Um, but there's also been the, the rolling out of smart borders between the US and, and Mexico smart digital borders, which are conceptualized. I think when people hear smart borders, they think safer borders, perhaps more humane borders. But what researchers are showing is that they're actually more deadly and they're leading to more precarious routes, mm. including for refugees and asylum seekers who have claims um, uh, to entry. And so there, that example, I think, highlights how you can have a public that is not paying attention enough to understand that well-intentioned framings of technological interventions are actually reproducing and amplifying racialized and kind of ethnically based mm -hmm. forms of exclusion plus technology companies that stand to make a lot of money and many of these technology companies are operating transnationally um right it's like the same mm -hmm handful of big tech companies in, in all the different parts of the world that I think mean that we are in a situation where there is an explosion of the use of tech that is worth noting, even though many of the um, ideologies or motivators for racialized forms of exclusion are age old ones. So that's one thing I would highlight. Another is that we are operating in a world where I think ethno-nationalist politics have just been let out of the box in, in, in ways that are remarkable. They're not brand new, but they're definitely remarkable. And you see this happening in different parts of the world, in the, glo in the global north, absolutely, but even in the global south, where um, identity and and kind of and and I think your work speaks to this as well. The, the ways in which nations and I and and kind of the identities of nations are being articulated. Um, really relies on the exclusion of certain groups and then technologies are being deployed in ways that make it easier to exclude. So I've spoken about external borders, but I know your work talks about internal borders and the ways that systems within yeah. countries can actually be used to exclude yeah. racial and ethnic and other mm -hmm. minorities um, in ways that may end up making them stateless. So these are just a few thoughts on why now, um, even though I think the history is important to keep um, in mind as well. Yeah. I mean, for me, that was um, one of the most fascinating facets because um, I write about the concept of digital colonialism, which is very much about the same thing is that we had this past practice of colonization. We had this past practice of statehood, of, of building, of, you know, sort of hewing a nation state by force, by violence, by intimidation, um, and then trying to construct it into a cohesive uh, entity that could be exploited for profit. And the digital ID um, was a big part of that project. And the, the, the current sort of wave of research that I'm working on is, um, is uh, with other people is really about that, is about how the, the core idea of sorting people by ethnic identities and then 
making that a basis for entitlements is a projection of power from a state that is trying to divide and rule and sort of make it easier to put in place um, labor, um, you know, forced labor regimes, to put in place exclusionary regimes. Um, here we talk about the Somali population, we talk about the Nubian population. And so I found it really, really fascinating that, like you said, you, you're talking about the external border and a play as a site where the state is projecting its power. Um, and I, I wanna sort of, because a big part of the report deals with uh, refugees and migrants, displaced persons who are uniquely vulnerable. But the report shows that, that the vulnerability doesn't always come from where you think it might. Of course, we know, you know the states at the border are going to project their power there. But there's another facet to the vulnerability that refugees and displaced persons are dealing with. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about this concept of Jada, you have frozen just as you were about Valence to humanitarianism and how it played out in some of the mm -hmm. uh, I was asking about the concept of surveillance humanitarianism. Surveillance humanitarianism. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anjala. And and this is a term that um at least became familiar to me through the work of, of Mark Latinero, this idea that we have mm -hmm. what we might think of as surveillance humanitarianism, which, you know, through the increased reliance on digital technologies and service provision and other um, bureaucratic um, processes, what you see is perversely the result of exclusion of refugees and, and asylum seekers from essential um, services. So the report, as I mentioned, deals with practices associated with states, with private corporations, but then also looks at um, agencies, humanitarian agencies, which we think of as coming in to do good, but as we also know, can often be some of the sites of where you have the worst forms of exploitation because of, again, the history of humanitarianism, but also the ways that these practices are being um, rolled out. And so the, the uh, concept of, of surveillance uh, humanitarianism really spotlights, really spotlights how in the context of, of provision of humanitarian services now, you have massive biometric data collection um, and these systems being deployed, again, as I mentioned, sometimes as a mechanisms for identifying refugees and asylum seekers, and then also for being able to, to manage worries around kind of low level fraud, ensuring that people are who they say they are when they're receiving services. But what you see is that when things go wrong in these contexts, things go very, very wrong, and they go wrong at a number of different level. So one is just the type of data that's being extracted and the terms on which the data is being extracted from these groups. You know, your, your livelihood sometimes as a refugee, as an asylum seeker, as, a, as an involuntary migrant may depend on, on your being able to access aid from these organizations. And when the exchange is, we're going to collect your data in exchange for food, the notion of informed consent, I think, really comes under a lot of pressure. And I think we might we have to ask very difficult questions about the terms on which this data is being extracted, data that these groups often have no idea, no control over where it's going to, to go. And I think even the people or the entities extracting the data don't necessarily have a full conception of what the outcomes um, will be. And then there's also just denial of access to, to, to um, essential services if there are concerns with um, the way that the, the, the biometric systems are or are not able to recognize people. We know that many of the systems that are used to collect data, biometric data systems, like for example, facial recognition ones, have trouble with racial and ethnic um, minorities and even with women. And so the, the error rates and when errors occur, the kinds of high stakes, um, high stakes yeah. Context in which we're dealing with are really, really high. I know Jaivet will talk more about this and, and, and give some examples um, from his own experience. And so the idea is that even when you have these well-intentioned interventions by humanitarian organizations, we have to be very careful about the terms on which the tech is being deployed, the terms on which the data is being extracted, and the terms on which service are being provided, and the fact that the groups that are most targeted are racially, ethnically, and religiously marginalized groups as well. Yeah. yeah. I. I... I found the examples to be both fascinating and, and troubling um, um, because one of the things that has emerged um, in the work that we've been doing on digital ID systems is the fact that humanitarian agencies have been running digital ID systems in the country for refugees and displaced persons, um, but without a framework. So we said that we couldn't, in Kenya, for example, we said, the court said that we couldn't have a digital ID system until we had a data protection law. Mm -hmm. And so the whole registration was stalled. But it turns out, and researchers have documented this, that 
the aid agencies had been running a digital ID system for refugees and one that was very explicitly, as you point out to you in your report, very explicitly tied entitlements, food, shelter, mm -hmm. you know, other services of domestic oversight. And I find it, I found it really powerful that the report took a moment to uplift that conversation because I think sometimes in the humanitarian space, people can tell themselves that we, our intentions are good. And so it's okay that we operate outside these um, very simple, but also very urgent restrictions on our power to collect, to process information. Mm -hmm. um, as a person who works in tech, they are names, they are corporations that are named in this um, report that have always been a red flag for anybody who has been working on, on digital ID. You know, we're talking about Palantir, we're talking about Frontex, we're talking about all of these agencies that have a past passion history of exploitation. Um, and I found it to be really important that the report didn't shy away from saying, this is also a problem. Um, embedded in that is something that the running of experiments, you know, that migrants, refugees become these um, test populations, you know, where all of these technologies are deployed and the ethics of that. And I guess I just wanted to, uh, to take a heartbeat before we move to the next um, uh, moment, sort of here, if you have sort of any reflections about this other layer of vulnerability that exists, which is who is going, who is going to speak up? You know, you've got all of these recommendations what hope do you have that someone is going to speak up for, especially these populations that are doubly sort of um, fragile, they're doubly fragile because they're existing outside the protection of a nation state, which is for better or worse, recognized as the keeper of our rights in some regards. What hope do you have and where do you see the hope that your recommendations are going to be implemented? Where do you see that coming from? Mm. Yeah, Ninjala, this is a really, it's a really difficult um, question. And I have to say, you're tapping into some of the aspects of this work that I think is the most, it, it, that I find the most disheartening um, for a number of reasons. And before I share that, I want to say that on this question of technological experimentation, I want to um, highlight the report that the Migration Technology Monitor just released that's uh, authored by Petra Molnar that really spotlights experimentation in the context of the, of the Mediterranean. That's a, a great report that does more than my own one does on that particular issue it's a very scary one but on this question of kind of where do we see the hope it's easy to be um i think depressed about about where hope might be just because one of the powerful things about borders or one of the the the, the strengths of borders as mechanisms of subordination is that for those who are subject to them in the most vicious ways refugees migrants and other non-citizens that designation as a non-citizen does the work of making it almost impossible for you to access the kinds of protections that citizens might be able to leverage to push back against um, emerging digital technologies. And that's part of why I thought it made sense to have a report focusing on non-citizens just because in most domestic regimes and even in most domestic regimes, right? And, and at the national, at the local level, which is where human rights are typically vindicated, um, the kinds of protections um, that are the most meaningful are reserved for citizens. And so this is why we see rampant abuses against migrants, refugees, non-citizens, precisely because they are deprived of the legal protections and the political voice that would allow them to make a difference. And I think this raises huge concerns. And then if you look at the kind of civil society landscape and you think about who's doing advocacy, I think there's a lot of powerful human rights advocacy on behalf of migrants and refugees. Too often it excludes migrants and refugees from a, a, a decision making seat at the table. So that's also a reason to be concerned about relying on civil society organizations. And then within that, I would say that issues to do with racial, ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic and religious forms of discrimination are often marginalized within kind of human rights advocacy yeah. as well. And so, and, and then also the individuals who would be best placed to articulate criticisms are kind of around racial and ethnic and other forms of injustice are marginalized in those spaces as well. So. I think there's just a stacking of so much exclusion and, and, and subordination that is what I think systemic racism is all about. That means that it's difficult to understand where hope and change um, comes from. I've been, um, I've been heartened in my work as Special Rapporteur though, to see that 
in the wake of the racial justice uprisings that we saw over the, you know, June, July, I want to say summer, but it's only summer in the Northern Hemisphere, it's not summer in other places. Um, I've been heartened to see that in the wake of those uprisings, I've been having consultations with migrants' rights groups that are really interested in centering a racial justice perspective, which I think will also filter into engagements with digital technologies. Um, the consultations that I had that were the most powerful, including the one hosted by ISI, involved actually migrants and refugees, some of them who were working in movement mobilizations, others of, of whom were working individual capacity as kind of researchers, I would say Jaivet is an example um, of this kind of a role. I think the most exciting knowledge being produced on how we move forward is being produced by refugees and migrants themselves. Mm -hmm. And the question is how we get them into the spaces of, of where decisions are made to be able to make those interventions. And the recommendations that I provide in the report, which are many and include things like requiring states to take seriously international human rights law around equality and non-discrimination, and even things like the principles on the deprivation of, of nationality in the national security um, uh, context, which uh, were published by ISI and others, really looking at that guidance and centering it, but above all, finding ways to include migrant and refugee populations in decision-making mm -hmm. about the adoption of tech, in accountability mechanisms um, regarding the adoption of tech. And it's tough, I make all of these recommendations who knows whether they will be adopted by states and also the recommendations are made for me against the backdrop of really feeling that the, the issue inheres in the injustice of the way that borders are constructed themselves. So going back to your uh, comments that you were making earlier about how the borders of most nations reflect really unjust history, some of them are colonial, some of them are imperial, yeah. but not necessarily colonial. We're dealing with fundamentally unjust institutions when we're dealing with borders. You layer the technology over them and we think about how we tackle, you know, discrete aspects of that injustice and it's really um, disheartening. But I would say my hope lies in finding ways to shift power. That that really has to be what the mm -hmm. emphasis is. And, and the recommendations in the report, I think, are trying to articulate policy moves for shifting power to those groups that are most subordinated by the regimes as they exist um, today. That's such a powerful place um, sort of to pause and, and reflect because I think what you've touched on is, is so important, this intersection of marginalization, right? Because you have vulnerable people being exposed to technology built by people who don't listen to vulnerable people giving being given oversight by institutions where those people are still marginalized and people not really knowing how to to process all of these things together right and and res resorting to this um sterile you know it's the tech is good it doesn't matter you know we don't have to deal with the complexity but here's a policy document that is saying let's let's talk about the complexity Let's talk about what happens when we don't talk about complexity and in very practical terms, right? We're not saying, you know, uh, hypothesizing about in 20 years, in 40 years, we're saying this is what our world looks like right now because we have failed to stop and pay attention to the dimensions of exclusion, of discrimination, of rejection, of dehumanization that are built into the systems in which we live. And I think that's tremendously powerful. I really did appreciate um, sort of reading the whole report. I was like skimming all the way through. Um, and I wanted to bring, uh, I, I have to pause at this particular point to bring Jaivat into the conversation because I think Jaivat uh, represents, uh, like you said, a lot of what you were trying to accomplish with this report. Here is a person who is both working in tech and has and tech as, as deployed um, in uh, at borders and with migrate in the migration context, but has also survived um, the experience of you know transitioning through these borders and, and moving through these borders. So, um, Jaibet, um, um, love to to see your face <laughs> first of all. But um, it's great to have you on with uh, with us, and it's great to have you in this conversation. And um, you were part of a team that wrote a report um, about the impact of digital ID on Rohingya populations um, in, in Burma um, and in Bangladesh and in India. And I was just wondering if you could begin by give, take, just you know, taking a couple of minutes um, to tell us why this report was important. What was it that um, um, you were seeing and you were experiencing that you think that people don't realize about this most urgent humanitarian crisis that um, really, should be higher up, I guess, on the international agenda. Try that. <laughs> 
All right. Um, thank you so much again uh, for bringing me in. So the report that the ISI um, and other um, collaborators produced the impact of digital system, ID system, particularly to the Rohingya case. Um, the Rohingya case is a little bit, could be different from other areas where digital ID is being implemented. Um, first, digital IDs in the Rohingya camps and the Rohingya inside were almost made as a as a conditions for people to give out their data so that they can have access to livelihood. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this also in refugee camps uh, where the giving out of data is almost make a almost make a requirement to access very basic food from water to medicine. And most of the time what happened during this data collection process where the refugees and other were arch in a distressed situations as soon as they arrive. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to have access to food, you have to give a data. For Rohingyas inside the Burma, if you want to access to market, you have to give up the data. And these data were collected and designed by some of the parties that were not necessarily the one using it. So what happened is when somebody else collected data, and the other party use it, it, was, it is not often what it was originally intended for. For Rohingyas in Burma that we particularly highlighted in the, in the ISI paper was like, first of all, Burma doesn't have any privacy or data protection law, but the mm -hmm. little bit of like access to information law that exists only give the benefit and the coverage to the citizen only. And this does not apply to the Rohingya again. So even if that data collections and the ID were according to the law, the people, the most vulnerable Rohingya do not benefit from this law. And in a, mm -hmm. instead of like being access to food and being access to citizenships in a way which we're hoping mm -hmm. for, what happened is the adverse effect that against the, the surveillance yeah. using this data. Yeah. So it is yeah. quite a bit of um, difference and very, more in depth in the paper, but that's basically what happening. The data were collected by one party being used the other party. In the case of machine learning, the people who design it doesn't even have the control anymore. The algorithm yeah. developed over the time and then learned yeah. itself. Like you cannot just simply modify it anymore when it went into the machine learning and deep state of algorithm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've always found the Rohingya case to be fascinating because um, first of all, like we were talking about with Tendai before, this is not something new. And you, you pointed out in your report that identity discrimination against the Rohingya is actually something that's old. It's been practiced before. And the technology has actually just sort of come in to make the state more efficient in its discrimination and more efficient in its exclusion. And I was wondering if you could take maybe a, an, again, a minute or so to reflect a little bit on this past history of identity discrimination. Um, there's a, a couple of pages um, in the paper, but maybe if you could just single out one or two examples of what identity discrimination against the Rohingya looked like before the technology so that people can have a better sense of the historical connection that's happening here. Right. Historically, Rohingyas were given out identity and ID card in different various forms throughout the history that allowed authorities to single them out and that allowed authority to identify that you are Rohingya. But there are certain Rohingyas, including myself at one point, where you were out of this confined open prison zones. You, have, you are not easily identifiable. And if you can speak the language and maneuver through little bureaucracy, you are actually um, allowed to access certain facilities like educations, which are not necessarily tied to the citizenship until to a certain level. And what happening or what's about to happen with Burma trying to go into digital ID is these digital IDs other than race and religion being listed, they are also will have like certain filter and certain tag that will be a able to identify the geolocations, the birthplace and where you came from. And this essentially pinpoint where Rohingyas are coming from. And if you are as a part of a state, you can no longer just try to um, keep a low profiles and access to like some other basic livelihoods. And digital ID will enable authorities to pinpoint your locations and then geo data. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I want to ask you a really abstract question and um, feel free to take uh, time to think about it if you want to, because I think we, again, we don't want to fall into the same trap of talking about these things as if they are just abstract things and they're just policy things, because you've actually been on the other side of some of these policies, uh, both as a researcher and as a person who's lived through them. And maybe you, if I could invite you to reflect a little bit to share your reflection, what does that feel like, you know, as a, as a person who is in a society um, to have a machine, a computer that, you know, you don't know, you've never inter interacted with, be, have this power to make these decisions over your life and the uh, uh, things that you're able to access on a daily basis. The worst of the worst part is when you do not have a person that you can reason with, you do not have a person you can talk with, it is a machine that's giving you one or zero and it doesn't listen to any errors and any other reasonable fact that changes over time during the time when you were the tower collected. That was that was the worst point where once being collected, once the machine is making the decisions, there is no flexibility or there is no other persons to reason it with, to explain the situations mm -hmm. and the development. And that's mm -hmm. make it harder at some point to actually access to certain food and you develop certain allergies, but your allergies were not documented or were not collected or were not even asked when the data were being collected. And now the machine is dispensing the food, you have no longer way of correcting it. And to go through the whole paperwork, the whole system, since the machine is in place, the machine is the first interactive point, it take usually much more effort and a longer time to, fix, to get it fixed. Mm -hmm. And this is happening at a, a, a national scale, right? You're talking about millions of people who are being displaced um, and it follows you, you know, even if you manage to, to leave Burma, you're talking about people, we've talked about surveillance humanitarianism in camps in Bangladesh, in camps in India, in camps Manus Island, this whole spectrum sort of follows the displaced person, right? Um, and it, does, it, does it that sense of powerlessness also just follow you through as, as you go through all of these uh, processes? Definitely, definitely. Um, it's in a way when it's become more, more machine and more um, data, it's, there is a whole element of dehumanizing in the camps and especially this was true in the Manus Island, you were not even called by name, but you were called by number. And then like addition of these machines just basically make you a number in the whole systems and there the, the human element was completely reduced to just a number and there isn't that anymore. Mm -hmm. So that kind of mm -hmm. actually empowered the uh, feeling less of a person, but more of a number or more of a stack mm -hmm. documents, stack data. In this world in which the governments are deploying this technology in this way, the humanitarian agencies are part of the systems that are deploying in this, this way, um, where as a researcher, both as a researcher and as a person who, as I said, has, has experienced this stuff, um, what are the people, what are the voices that you think need to be heard? Like what kind of organizations, what kind of institutions, like who could we bring into this conversation? Who needs to be working on these issues? Um, like just off the top of your head, what are the silences that you're seeing and like who would you love to see more engaged with these issues? Um, first will be the donor that will providing, for example, in for Burma, there was like a lot of um, funding from UNFPA and a lot of other UN private donors as well. And first of all, these donors who are making the systems available, like they have a huge play, uh, a huge part to play. And the second one is the technological company, for example, in Burma, it is the French multinational company, Tails, who were about to provide the digital ID. Um, I would like to see these people and realize that there is much more beyond the data and there is much more what they are collecting. Also the collection process, oftentimes the collection process took place as much as they can collect, not what is needed. Mm -hmm. And in data, in a way of being more fluid, in a way of more um, things that you can derive from the data, it is often take in a way like um, you take one filter from that place, one the other filter from another place. 
And when you collected all this accumulated and see from a central database point, you can it has almost this um, intersectional form of discriminations that each factor contributed mm -hmm. that were not realized by the collecting party. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the collecting agency, the multinational corporations and other technological providers should only take what is needed at the moment and what, but not what as much as they, there is just, sometimes it's just arbitrarily collected just because they can. And in the case of Rohingya who were in Bangladesh, for example, there is a talk of going on that the, the UNAIDS here collected data will be transferred back to Burmese government well during the repatriations of yeah. this Rohingya refugee. And the data collected, these were like granular, very, very granular data without any, without hardly any supervisions of any legal or other human rights protection agency. And such data were to be transferred back to Burma and could it could, it, it could be interpreted from a lot of different angles and potentially used for surveillance and which is yeah. almost happening and happened quite sometimes as well. Uh, yeah. I want to uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Jaibat. I think it's a very important um, um, dimension that you're adding to these assessments, because as I said, at least in the work that I've done in the tech space, a lot of the times people just stop at, does, it, does the technology work? Um, is it doing what it's supposed to do? Okay, then we stop there. Um, and I think hearing from you that, you know, even if it works, what is it working at? What is it doing? What is it actually implementing? I think is an important point of reflection. I want to leave both, as we go into the q and I want to leave both you and Tendai a question to think about that I will come back to you at the end of the presentation. And my question is very simple. What does justice look like in this context? What would justice look like, um, especially for refugees and migrants in an increasingly datafied world, in a world in which data is increasingly being used to police, to harden, to consolidate borders. So I'm going to let you um, think about that as we move into the Q&A section. I'm going to take a couple of questions that have been asked in the chat room. Um, and then I'll give you, I'll, I'll take three questions for you and, and Tendai, for Jaivet and Tendai, and then um, they can answer and then we'll go back and forth. Um, so the first question is, hmm. Tendai, this is for you. You say that there is an assumption that borders are just. Could you elaborate on the, that presumption, the presumptions that borders are inherently just um, and why it is problematic? Um, and sort of tied to that is, can there be a positive role for technology in addressing the injustices in the border? Um, another question for you, Tendai. Um, do you think that digital borders will face a particular challenge in the context of climate-induced migration? Because there doesn't seem to be any agreement on whether climate change interacts with migration and how we can classify such movements. Um, and finally, uh, for you, Jaivet, um, considering especially that, as we said, the history of discrimination against the Rohingya in, in Burma precedes displacement, right? It's before um, this massive wave of displacement. Could you extrapolate on how these practices, or could you tell us a little bit more about how these practices impact minorities that are not yet stateless and are not yet at the border? What kind of concerns do you have? And how do we think about this as a racial justice issue? So if we could take those three questions, those two for you, Tendai, and one for you, Jaivet. Okay, thanks a lot, Nanjala. And thank you to the audience member who asked that question, which is uh, the first, all of the questions, but the one about the injustice of, of borders. And I could talk for a really long time about this, but I'll try and be quick. And I've, I've written about this in my non-special rapporteur capacity and more in my academic capacity. And I think we might think of the injustice of borders at multiple levels, right? So in most nations and even within the international human rights uh, regime, there are going to be divisions or rights that are allocated on the basis of citizenship and, and, and some rights to which non-citizens are not entitled. And we can talk about the justice or injustice of that, but I want to identify that the kinds of borders I'm thinking about are not just the physical borders of the nation, but also the political borders that are associated with whether you have citizenship or whether you don't have citizenship. And then when we think about, about the territorial borders, the national borders that 
characterize much of the world and the way that they operate. If you think about, say, the borders of, uh, let's say the borders between Europe and the African continent, and I'm going to highlight that border regime because the, the report talks a fair amount about the deployment of digital borders by the EU, you know, the kind of technology that's taking place in the Mediterranean and the pushbacks that are being um, um, empowered by technological intervention there as well. I think for many within Europe, um, there is a sense that the people who are trying to cross don't have real entitlements to be in Europe because they are economic migrants who are fleeing bad things that happen in their country that are completely unrelated to anything that might be taking place in, in Europe. And so there's a sense that the decision may be unfortunate, but it's definitely not unjust because the people who are approaching the borders are outsiders and we, the insiders, have built our nations in ways that mean that we can exclude these groups. But I would venture to say that most border regimes really get wrong how we understand who is an insider and who is an outsider, right? You think about Syrian refugees and you think about how many Syrians are, free, are fleeing circumstances in which the international community has been deeply complicit in creating those conditions of destabilization. So I remember in, in 2016 when the U.S. was reducing the numbers and actually banned Syrian refugees from being able to come to the U.S., the U.S. was, was involved in, 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 the, in the conflict in Syria and was part of fueling the displacement that was, was resulting in the displacement of those people. So this pattern of governments in one place intervening in the territories of another place and then using their borders as a mechanism for closing off accountability for the lives that they destroy, I think makes borders very effective at um, at basically sustaining regimes of, of injustice, of basically saying you are an outsider, even if your vulnerability and what's making you move is a direct product of the nation that is excluding you. Um, in my own work, I've written about legacies of colonialism and the fact that so much of what Europe is today is a product of its exploitative relationship with the African continent and many others in the past and that's ongoing today, such that when Europe is treating you know, Africans as, as, as kind of strangers with no entitlements, the injustices of colonial extraction, which were never remediated, are completely ob obfuscated in the, in the kind of legitimacy discourse that is imbued into the ways that borders operate. You might think about a, a similar thing in, in the US and its relationship to Central and South America. The, the US has an ongoing history of military, economic, and other forms of exploitation and extraction from that region, so that the people who turn up at the US southern borders are not strangers. Those are people who are fleeing imperial intervention that makes, I think, their claims really legitimate to inclusion. You think about the context that Jai Vet was describing of uh, Rohingya and Myanmar, where people who have very legitimate claims to the territories in which they have deep connections are being constructed as, as outsiders. And that move of constructing you as a non-citizen or as an outsider creates a border that then has a kind of neutrality to it that is kind of then ultimately enforced. I could go on about this for a while, but that's the kind of conversation I'm talking about or the kind of analysis I have in mind when I say that we presume that borders are just, but oftentimes those lines are drawn in ways that don't recognize the deep interconnection um, and obligations that exist among the people who are placed on the inside and on the outside. And what we see now is techno technology kind of um, doubling down um, on that. Now, in terms of... Um, whether there is a role for technology, I think there was the, 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 the second part of the question is, is there a role for technology in undoing those injustices? Is that right? You're muted, Nandala, sorry. I should have been paying attention, but it's like the question. No, 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 you, you're, you're right. I, <laughs> you're absolutely right. That was the second question. Um, is there a positive role for technology in ameliorating the inherent injustices of borders? Yeah. So I think about this question as, as the technology itself, right, which has its own power, and I think it's the, the neutrality that clouds technology or the presumed neutrality means that technology is a variable that we have to tr keep track of. But whenever I'm asked questions about whether there's a positive role for technology, I think that really comes down to whether there are ways of deploying technology in ways that shift power to the groups that are most subordinated, right? Can we, can we conceptualize regimes in which technology is in the hands of those who are subordinated 
in ways that result in kind of more empowering rather than disempowering solutions. And if we can answer that question, I think that's when we can think about positive role of tech. So I've shied away from, you know, giving good practices of where technology was used, you know, the ID was used in this way and it resulted access to, in, in these access to rights. I think some of that stuff can be really valuable, but what I'm most interested in is can we can we imagine a deployment and a mobilization of technology that is shifting power in, in, in ways that are meaningful? And if we can, then yes, I think technology can, can play a very um, powerful role in, in kind of undoing the injustice of borders. And I think some of this you see in the cre creative uses that migrants and refugees have made of say cell phones and, and, and kind of social media networks where there's, there's a capacity to share information that pushes back against regimes of exclusion. And even even those I think are being undone by the kind of surveillance of, of cell phones and kind of communications among refugees and migrants who are attempting to use technologies in ways that push back against these, some of the injustices um, that I've been describing. And then on the question of, of climate change, you know, will, will digital borders face um, pressure from climate induced migration? I actually think that digital borders are being amplified as a response to climate induced migration. So what we're seeing, you know, among the factors that I think will result in greater rolling out of digital borders is actually see governments seeing on the horizon that the ways in which they have related to the, um, to the environment through capitalism, through other modes of extraction is completely unsustainable and is triggering movements that they are going to try and halt through digital borders. And the advantage that digital borders provide, I think, is that they mask some of the brutality or at least push that brutality further out in a way that means that governments get to get away with more kind of brutal regimes of exclusion. So this is, I guess, in response to that question, I think it's going to be the reverse. I think that the board, the digital borders are going to get more and more enhanced in the face of climate induced migration and they will become more brutal. It's not clear to me alone that the fact of climate migration will disrupt or undercut the spread of digital, of, of digital borders. I think that disruption has to be one that is rooted in a different politics. So what I'm hoping is that climate justice campaigns will align with border justice campaigns in ways that shift the way that we think about digital borders, because without a shift in the politics, I don't think we're going to get a shift in the regimes. I think the regimes will just become more and more brutal and societies or nations will become desensitized to the kind of violence that they see at the border and will kind of naturalize it in the various ways that I think we, we as societies naturalize violence that takes place at the border. I bet you want to go ahead and answer that question about um, how these some of these practices might impact minorities who are not stateless at the borders, and specifically thinking about the history um, of the uh, Rohingya in, in Burma. The minorities that are not yet stateless, I think uh, they could learn a good lesson like from what happened with the Rohingya people in Burma. It's like, the process of a statelessness or differentizing of the Rohingyans did not happen in a day or in a week or in a month. It is like a rather a gradual erosion of their identity over the over the period of like five to six to six decades by now. And this has been implemented by by the military regimes and other um, governments step by step at one point at one point, and then it's a gradual erosion from the full citizenships in my grandparent generation to complete a statelessness in my generations. So I think the transformations of digital ID could be good or could be bad, depending on how you seize the opportunities and certain things that to make sure you can either seize this opportunity of transformations and make sure that digitalization does not single you out or does not erode your identity or what you claim of. And also it makes sure that the, the identity that these minorities were given digital IDs or any other form of digital I, uh, digitalizations of their identity, it does not single them out and it gives them the same as privilege and the same as coverage um, as other majorities of, majorities of that state. And it will be, this will be different depending on the minority and a specific factor, for example, the and it was a geolocation. If you were born in this place, that's when the discrimination applied, and this could be different depending on the minority. So I think it is really important for a minority who are not yet a stateless to give a special attention to 
in the process of digitalization, their identity and their um, their current claim is not being eroded in any way, and or in the process of who are stateless are trying to um, regain or trying to restore their citizenship. For example, in Rohingya, it is very important that the the law and the the law that are discriminating in the paper based identity does not get the chance to transform into digital identity because once it's been digitalized, we can see that it's lasting longer than the paper based one and would be even harder to um, to fix it. Fantastic. Um, for the next round of questions, I have two questions for Jaivet and um, one for Sendai. Um, Jaivet, the two questions are, um, how does this, how do these practices or how are these practices affecting children? Um, the data collection of your children um, and, and even though the state might not have local laws, there are international conventions that it is party to, like the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, the Optional Protocol on the Sale of Children, which specifies exploitation and multiple forms of exploitations and prohibitions on multiple forms of exploitation. So the question is basically asking, you know, are, are children being involved or implicated in some of these practices? Um, and, you know, has there been any kind of documentation or, you know, any kind of follow up to that? Um, and then the other question that is sort of related to this is about um, sort of using beneficial practices or beneficial um, goods as kind of like an entry point to some of this widespread data collection. It's something that is touched on um, in, the, in the report. It's something that you've mentioned. And the specific question is um, in the area of education, there's been a push for the digitalization of education. Is it not also risky, isn't it risky to reduce education programs for refugees? Um, isn't there a risk to data privacy and to protection of the human rights of children through programs like digital um, education programs? Um, and Sindai, the question for you is about Human Rights Council as a follow-up to this report. Um, David, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, okay. I can go. Um, regarding the first questions, um, sorry, I, I lost the, the first point of the question, sorry. The question was about children and whether children, oh. these practices are affecting children. Yeah, um, there have been some documented cases where they just fall in the wrong hand and this child, these kids were actually used in the in the human trafficking, you know, uh, like these data is where oftentimes there is chances of like falling into the wrong hand. And especially if you're talking in a isolated island or an isolated um, refugee camp. And even though the domestic law does not protect them and there are other law to protect them, like these laws were vaguely enforced in these places. And it is as refugee camps and other detention camps, it is much of a people have other bigger concerns of their food security, their shelters, and it is often organized, not very well organized and often temporary chaos. So the enforcements of these laws are like at best questionable. And even if the agency, the UN agency and other agency who are doing the work there, who are collecting the data and providing the goods, there are often chances, and there has been examples um, where the data fall into the wrong hand through extortions, briberies, and others. And um, and the, the uh, specific to the children and the and the girls like end up in the human trafficking because of this data. So there is a huge risk when it comes to the case. Um, regarding the educations, I'm not quite sure if uh, I get the question right or if I have like specific take on that. We are also the the organization that we co I co run so are also pushing the access to education so that like essentially when they, the, the Rohingyas are being re repatriated like they are well informed and then they can speak for themselves so that there isn't a third wave or a fourth wave of genocide being repeated and we've been pushing for educations um one of the way that education is being provided like there is being online also mean like you do not need a physical space and you do not have like the other constraint that came along with uh, maintaining a physical school inside a refugee camp. 
I don't see a way of data, uh, data privacy being affected to it if the education provider were independent university or independent organizations being provided, not by the governments or not by the agency working there. And the students or the refugee students have access to sign up for themselves and then to, um, to administer the term, by, not, by the two, not through the refugee camps or the governments of that place. That's great. Um, Tendai, if you would like to take the question about how would you like the Human Rights Council to follow up on some of these conversations? Mm -hmm. um, in a number of different ways, but I think the most urgent thing that I think is essential for the Human Rights Council is to really take seriously that equality and non-discrimination norms are implicated by emerging digital technologies, because I think there's you've seen within the, human, the, the UN context greater attention to human rights consideration where tech is concerned, but again, I think there has to be an increasing emphasis on the fact that it's not just privacy and, and speech rights that are concerned, but that the equality and non-discrimination has to be an anchor. So I think if the Human Rights Council could initiate more processes and devote more resources to actually fleshing out those norms, I think that would be really important. I think there has to be greater attention as well to the way that UN bodies are partnering with technology companies, you know, in the in the ways that they are building out the frameworks around um, uh, human rights and tech. So I'm just I'm going a little bit off script here, but I'm often stunned in when I go to Geneva to find that you know, you meet with delegates from the big corporations like Facebook and, um, you know, Twitter, Google, all these, these entities have kind of diplomatic wings that I think end up partnering with even the UN agencies that are supposed to be articulating the way that the human rights standards apply to these um, frameworks. And, you know, I don't think that we should operate in a world where there is no engagement with the corporate world. I think we absolutely have to engage the corporate world because they have so much power in this space. But I think we have to be very careful with the way that those engagements take place. And we have to make sure that the world making capacity of corporations isn't inflecting the way that the kinds of norms and governance standards are being articulated um, as well. And then the final thing I would say is that, and this I think might be too much to hope for, but really putting on an onus on the Human Rights Council to find ways of insisting that migrants, refugees, and stateless persons are represented in knowledge production around these issues, right? So when they are seeking experts to give feedback on how the tech is operating, what it can and cannot do, really ensuring that those groups that are the most impacted are considered epistemic sources at the level of actually even the framing of the nature of the problem, I think would be, would be really, really, um, important. So those are just some thoughts on, on immediate things that I would hope would, would happen. But maybe a more basic thing is I just want them to read the report. That would be a good start. If, if, you, if you and Human Rights Council members could read the report, that would be a great start. <laughs> they better read it. If anyone is in this call, please read it. It's, it's, it's really tremendous. I don't say that loudly. I think it's really tremendous and it's really important. Um, we, are, we have about seven minutes. Um, so I'm going to end with um, one question, I guess, uh, for each of you. Um, there is one question which is inviting you, Tendai, to reflect on the World Bank's ID4D per program. If you've had any thoughts um, on that, if you had any thoughts on that, um, I, it doesn't, the question doesn't specify whether it's the concept or the implementation, but maybe if you have any thoughts on the World Bank's ID4D program. Um, and then there is a question here that I think, I think that you could uh, provide us insight to Jaivet, um, which is how these practices of biometrics are affecting alternatives to detention. Um, and the, the person who asked the question gave an example of how in India, there has been a push to use, um, there's been a push to use biometrics as a way of allowing people to um, not, basically to not be in camps. I'm trying to read the questions very quickly um, to, to, to have people not be in camps. So if you could reflect a little bit on alternatives to detention, and then Tendai and ID4D. And then there is one question here that I'm gonna try and simplify, because I think it can be simplified. When we talk about racial discrimination, we often forget indigenous populations. But I think in this report, you kind of briefly touched on it, on how indigenous populations um, are contemplated as both, uh, as suffering the very same patterns. And the question is basically inviting reflection on that particular issue. Um, how did the question, how did the indigeneity, indigenous populations 
factor into your assessment of these issues. Um, so maybe we start with Jaibet, if you could reflect a little bit on are, this, are these uh, biometric ID systems being used to advance alternatives to detention? And is that a good thing? Yeah, I think I can actually pinpoint to one particular example that can kind of reflect on this, the way biometric data, the collection of biometric data impacts the detentions of innocent people oftentimes is, um, once these biometric data are collected, these countries share this data with a bunch of other countries they have like their treaties or they have other um, agreement with. For example, in the case of Australia, it's like Australia share what they call I have five, like with other five countries, and then they are all biometric data ever came into the systems who are being shared. And that offshore detentions of asylum seekers in, in Australia was like ruled as, as unconstitutional by the, by the court, and at best it was imprisonment and torture. But yet people cannot escape because these data were being shared by other countries, and it is essentially extending the border of Australia like throughout the others and even though you are suffering tortures imprisonments you still cannot escape just because of this biometric data and this was one of my struggles when I was getting out of the detentions I could not go anywhere just because all of the major airports that I had access to were in some way data being shared by the Australian governments and I cannot go through this channel at all and I have to find other way of alternative not crossing this particular point that might flag me up because my biometric data were collected back in Australia like four years ago. Even worse example is, I'm not sure, but I will kind of vaguely give this uh, not to identify the certain information, like an emergency contact number that I gave at my first day during distress, like I wasn't even thinking. And then that phone number was used by the Australian governments all the way to the Burmese governments and to identify this individual who was living outside of a confined prison zones, like basically avoiding keeping a low profile and were able to identify it. So this like, it extend continent, not even like countries and borders. So this biometric data could lock in sometimes like people that also coincidentally the report that I said just released were naming like lock in and lock out like this biometric status like often used um, in this context and this very I think answer the, the question. Absolutely, absolutely answer the question. Um, today if I could come to you. Right, so I'll be I'll be brief, you know, and the the ID four D World Bank program, which I, I I haven't studied in in great detail, but my my one thing that I think that question provokes us to think about is these um, digital identification systems and programs as they affect non citizens um, as well. And so, in my first report, um, which focuses on race and tech, generally I take on this this topic, and I'm just looking at the ID four D initiative, which talks about social protection, health, financial inclusion governance, gender, and legal issues. And to the extent that they're talking about um, inequalities, it seems to be gender inequalities. And I'm, I'm for gender equality. I think that's really important. But I think what happens often in these digitization campaigns, which are aimed at, at expanding inclusion, is that ethnic, racial, and religious forms of exclusion are ignored or aren't prioritized. And then what you end up seeing is that the digitization, even of groups that are not you know, even in the context of, of, of not refugees, but just in different ethnic groups is that those groups are excluded from these processes in ways that are really um, troubling. And I think the original report gives examples from India and from Kenya where you have digitization that is supposed to be expanding access, but ultimately reproduces exclusion on an ethnic basis in ways that are really troubling. So can't speak directly to the World Bank program because I haven't studied it, but would say that I suspect that some of the concerns that are highlighted in my first report obtain with respect to that program as well. And then with respect to indigeneity, I think this is a really important question and you'll find that both this report and the, the previous report deal with indigenous um, peoples. And, and, and this, you know, most indigenous nations are subject to, to digital forms of exclusion within the interior. So they are 
supposed to be treated as full members of the nation. They are not treated in that way. And so the, the first race and tech report talks about how forms of discrimination operate against um, indigenous peoples in different ways. And then in this report, the one example I think that I was able to provide focuses on how there's some indigenous nations where the borders cross them and divide their territories and their nations up in ways that subject them to surveillance and, and different forms of, of kind of interventions that, that heighten their risk to human rights analysis even if they themselves are not moving and then um, in a report that we'll be producing hopefully with ISI we'll talk more about um, nomadic indigenous groups and groups that have a more mobile way of life and the ways that their life ways of living have been disrupted by digital intervention so that one is forthcoming hopefully but I think it's important to highlight that um, indigenous peoples can sometimes in in these assessments be written out of the story and in both reports I try to pay some attention to those issues. You know, one of the, uh, well, before I, I wrap up, I had asked you a question before and I'd like both of you, if you could just very quickly pick one thing, kind of like your concluding thought, what does justice look like um, to you? Is there one thing that you can think of that would bring us closer to a more just outcome in the context of all of the challenges that we have um, identified through this conversation, through your research, through your writing, through your lives, through your experiences? What, give us an example, maybe, what one thing would bring us closer to justice? Not a silver bullet, just an example. So for me, an important first step, I think, is, is um, more just ways of describing the nature of the problem. You know, we often think about just solutions, but I think here one of the interventions is just more accurate and just ways of describing exactly the way that borders are operating. And this goes back to the question that I answered earlier about just undoing the sense that we have that borders operate in a just way and really confronting yeah. the injustices, including on a racial, ethnic, and religious basis that are built into borders as an initial, as an initial starting point for reimagining a world where borders wouldn't operate in that way. So I think conversations like this to me are really important for challenging people's understanding of what's fair and what's not fair where mm. borders are concerned. So that re, yeah. re-description and re-articulation of the problem, I think, is an essential step towards true justice. Justice, yeah. Javet, how about you? My thought on the digital, my thought is more on par with the digital ID. I think um, at a time where like pandemic, certain access to certain resources were only um, confined to the citizen. And for example, in Bangladesh, only citizens were allowed to admit to the hospitals that's playing being funded by the governments. I think um, digitalizations of the ID could actually think of future scenario where non-citizen would need access to certain resources and then like this ID allowed them to access some sort of yeah. resources that are accessible to this non-citizen. In regard to the, the other second thought, my um, on, on the digital ID as well was the privacy and the, of data for groups who are not, who do not benefit from the protections of the law or who, whose uh, identities were not protected by the law that already exists um, in the places to give the ownerships of their own informations. Like, of course, everything that went on internet and that went in the database never disappear, like even though it just disappear on the surface, like deep down you can scoop it out. But there are mechanisms and technology to give you complete controls of your data. Like if at one point you do not want to be included in certain database, you have the options and you have the right to delete your own data or it is the participants or the persons who have the final say of like how or where his data is being shared. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both so much. That is, that's such a powerful place for us to stop. We're running a little bit over time, but I think um, at least certainly I've enjoyed this conversation tremendously. And I, I have enjoyed reading both of your reports so much because I think, again, these are things that a lot of people have been articulating and have been pushing for and have been pushing for. And to see a transnational dialectic starting to emerge whereby we're talking about what's happening in Myanmar, we're talking about what's happening in the Mexican border, we're talking about what's happening in Kenya, we're talking about what's happening on the Hungarian border, I think is a growing consciousness and a growing realization that 
first of all, because the challenge is also transnational, then the response to the challenge also has to be transnational. We have to listen to each other. We have to learn from each other. We have to exchange ideas in order to build a global justice movement against some of these very insidious forms of discrimination and very insidious forms of, of, um, of violence, really, of structural violence against the most vulnerable members of our population. And I want to just end by emphasizing something that I came up again to me when I was reading both of these reports, which is that using data is an interpretive act. Data is not a neutral thing. It, the numbers, the ones and zeros might be used neutral things, but us using them, we interpret them. And because it's an interpretive act, it is laced with our subjectivities, with our beliefs about who is a criminal, who is not a criminal, who is a citizen, who is not a citizen, who is good, who is not good, who is welcome and who is not welcome. All of those are subjective evaluations that are based on you know, anybody's life experiences on anybody's things that they read, you know, something that happened to them as a kid. And because of the subjectivity, we have to be very sensitive to how the most marginalized members of our societies experience those subjectivities. It's not going to go away just because the system is technically sound, just because the system was built by the best um, tech company out there, the person who had the best bid. All of those subjectivities will remain with us. And so it's important to ask the philosophical questions, ask the deeper questions, bring the complications back into the room so that we make sure that whatever we're proposing, whatever we're building, doesn't compound harm, doesn't make the harm more pernicious, doesn't make the harm, as Jay Beck pointed out, more difficult to escape. So I'm gonna stop there and I just wanna thank everybody who, who come, jumped on this call. Thank you for your questions. They were very thought provoking. I hope you saw me sort of trying to read all of them <laughs> very quickly. Um, and, and, and thank you to the panelists, to Tendai, to Jaivet, for your wonderful interventions, for your research, for your writing. I think that you've enriched the conversation on racial justice and on technology and our shared tech futures tremendously by both of these contributions. And I hope that there will be substantive and expansive engagement with both of them so that we can get closer to a more just uh, future for everybody. So thank you. Thanks, Najala. Thanks for doing such an excellent job. And thanks, Jaivet. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Behind the scene, we are finally making it possible for all the organizing work. Thank you also to our, our hosts. Yes, thank you. thank you to our hosts, of course. <laughs> How can I forget? <laughs> thank you to our hosts and to everybody who made this event possible, um, and to all the people who have been working behind the scenes um, to make this event possible. Thank you. We really appreciate the point that the opportunity to have this conversation.